Welcome to this Gillick Explains Finance video. This week, what are the three key drivers of investment bubbles? Well, I have a view, others may have a different view, but let's take a look. And two recent examples. I think they're examples of bubbles, other people may disagree, but here are the key ingredients that make something into a bubble. So here we go, the background is what? The game of professional investing, said no lesser figure than John Maynard Keynes, famous economist, is intolerably boring and over-exacting to anyone who's entirely exempt from the gambling instinct, whilst he who has it must pay to this propensity the appropriate toll. In other words, we get bored easily, and that is a problem when it comes to long-term investing, and it makes us classic suckers for potential bubbles and the people who promote them. Now, what do bubbles need? Because investors are not completely stupid, neither are gamblers. What do you need to create a bubble, if you like? What's the toolkit? Number one, a game-changing story. Not just a story, a game-changing story. I'll try and explain what I mean by that in a moment. You need to appeal to people on a wide scale. Number two, limited supply, actual or, or sort of creative, if you like. You need to sell the idea there's limited supply, get in early, get in now, and big demand. And an appetite for risk amongst investors. It helps if people are feeling a bit bored and want a bit of action. More about that coming up in a moment. Now, recent examples. So, despite their different paths, says Joe Riesenthal on Bloomberg Business Week, the crypto and cannabis bubbles are unmistakable siblings. And I tend to, to agree. I'm not saying never go there, never put any money in, but I'm saying trade extremely carefully. Now, why? How can you put those two things together? Well, you need a compelling story. Both of these have different but equally compelling stories linked by a common theme, if you like. So what is that? Well, Bitcoin, I've covered this in other videos in more detail, grew from the wreckage of financial crisis, and that helped because this is a mechanism, and again, I've got other videos that do this in more detail, so brief here. This is a mechanism which is anti-central bank, anti-Wall Street, or certainly could be portrayed that way. This is a way around having to use conventional currencies, around the conventional central bank system, if you like, around the control exerted by the liberal establishment, as it's sometimes called. So, with replacement currencies potentially uh, in, on offer, so the dollar being replaced by Bitcoin and Ether, this is a good story. If you add some mysterious non-city origins in, who is Sakamoto, who created the original Bitcoin stroke blockchain idea, advertise its anonymity. Now, it's not totally anonymous, but nonetheless, that sells into the sort of mysterious side of things and say it's accessible to all. And this is a way, essentially, you, you market it as a way to get around the conventional financial system that let us all down uh, 10 years ago, financial crisis. There you have your story. Okay, currencies could be consigned to history. This is the future. Now, whether it is or not, that is a compelling story. With cannabis, now, what's the story? Well, the story is age old, really. Um, its popularity, anyway, has surged since the financial crisis. Traditionally, it is linked to counterculture and rebellion. It's a little bit off-piece, a little bit left field, if you like, and that's because it's banned in most countries around the world in terms of selling it over the counter, if you want to put it that way. It's associated, with, therefore, with grassroots, anti-liberal, libertarian mindset. So it plays into some of the stuff that I mentioned over here, if you like. There's a sort of similar underground theme there. Now, what's the game changer? The game changer is arguably this. Canada wasn't the first country to, to, to legalise it. I think Uruguay can claim that one. But basically, the Canadian legalisation in 2018 represents a sea change. That is a big, major power suddenly saying, actually, this stuff is no longer underground per se. In other words, it can be bought legally across the counter. Now, that is the big change in, in regulation. And what people are looking at is saying, you know, promoters of this are saying, well, if we get that change, in other countries of equal importance to Canada, crikey, where could this end? And estimates range on the potential value of this market. I've seen an estimate based on 2015 spending of $6 billion, but I've seen estimates as high if other countries follow the Canadian path of $20, $30 billion. And there's your story. Now, to create a bubble, okay, you need a rush to get in early. And that is where limited supply comes in. So you need to persuade people that there is a limit on the number of tickets to the party, if you like. So with Bitcoin, that was fairly straightforward in a way. Well, they said there was the limited number of Bitcoins that can be created or mined, if you like. So there's a, there is a finite number. So get in early, if you like. And the more that are created, the harder they get to find, et cetera, et cetera. So there was a nice way to create some momentum in the early days of Bitcoin there. There's a small number of cannabis firms available investors. Everyone's heard of cannabis, but actually 
playing it via stocks, which are generally over the counter, is quite difficult. So that creates a bit of mystique. Okay, there are only a handful of ways you can actually directly invest in cannabis, if you like. Um, and therefore, beware the copycat rush. So in the early days, you tend to get this limited supply. And then of course, as people catch on, in the Bitcoin space, you had Ether and a whole load of rival currencies. You had ICOs going on every week, just before the market sort of toppled, if you like, last Christmas. That's December 2017. In the cannabis space, again, beware the copycat rush as people pick up on this story. So there's a window of opportunity when people are expected to rush in and take advantage. Ingredient two. A desire to take risk is ingredient three. You need people to be thinking, so like John Maynard Keynes warned, yeah, I want a bit of excitement. I want a bit of tail risk, if you like. Conventional investing's dull. So, S&P 500 has seen, here's some ingredients recently. The S&P 500 has seen its longest bull market in history. So people have ridden a wave of rising stock markets. And it's basically not too difficult to make some money when everything is rising. As Warren Buffett said, you only find out who's swimming naked when the tide goes out. Well, it hasn't gone out yet, and that's given people a sense of confidence, a sense of expertise. We know what we're up to. We've made money in stocks. And that potentially plays into the hands of people promoting uh, investment bubbles. Helped by cheap money and low volatilities. There's lots of liquidity around. Okay, there are lots of cheap sources of finance available out there and relatively low volatility. And those two ingredients play into the hands of people saying, you're looking for some excitement? Put your money to work over here creates confidence and a desire to take risk, wisely or otherwise. And here come the buts. So, I don't really understand what a lot of these cannabis companies do, which makes them a lot like shit coins. So said Aaron Lammer, podcast host, somewhat directly recently. And there's the point. An awful lot of people are investing early stage, invested early stage in things like Bitcoin, are investing early stage in things like cannabis, without really understanding the production process, without really understanding the market, what they're basing their investments on, if they're honest, is fear of missing out or pure gambling. And that's where things can get a little bit dangerous. So, why? Well, supply gluts are possible. At any moment, if you don't understand the market, if you don't understand the supply-demand forces correctly, you don't know how serious the competition is and how fast it'll get its act together. That's true in any market. There's regulator uncertainty. Yes, the cannabis story is compelling. The Canadians jumping on that bandwagon makes it a game-changing moment, potentially. But, in the US, there's plenty of evidence that they are not about to follow suit. So people will watch the US carefully and see what happens next, because the US could have quite a big influence on other regulators around the world. So yes, big move by Canada, but that doesn't necessarily get you to a $30 billion global market just overnight. And thirdly, information on these OTC stocks is limited, over the counter as it's called. So that creates the mystery, that creates the Crikey, you want to get in, we can get you in early, but it also creates some of the danger. These are fairly illiquid, not well-known companies, and therefore the information some of them disclose can be variable in its quality. So, in a nutshell, do, as a long-term investor, stick to your knitting, invest in proven ideas that you understand. If you can't resist the urge to invest in a bubble, okay, then Make sure you're only investing with what I'd call gambling money. Make sure you put money in that you are, you are comfortable losing 100% of. Now, no one deliberately loses 100% of their initial investment, but make sure you can afford to. Okay, that is the key. So decide how much you're going to invest, if, if you're going to have to satisfy your fear of missing out, but don't go mad. And thirdly, if it looks and smells like a bubble, it probably is. So if you've got the three ingredients I just described present, it probably is a bubble. There are no free lunches in the investing world, so tread with care. Message overall, always buyer beware. Any questions? Editor at gillick.com. And if you'd like to see some other videos, for example, those Bitcoin videos I talked about that go into some of that in more detail, then it's gillick.com forward slash learn.